we're starting our explanation on uh, number page eight, which is on sleeping and dreaming, I think. Uh, these are all going to be states of consciousness. So what that means is your brain's not off. It's just functioning differently. So drugs do this, which we'll talk about in notebook nine. Uh, and sleep and dream uh, states do this as well. So again, your body's still on and functioning, your brain's still on and functioning, but it's functioning differently. So it's taking in information differently, interpreting it, uh, and there are slightly different activities, but some of them are the same. Okay, so first we'll start off with the state of consciousness known as sleep. And again, anything I say that helps you remember this stuff, add it to what you already have. Uh, sleep. So, uh, without looking at your notes, if you look down, I won't call on you. Uh, why do we need sleep? It seems like a waste of time to me. I don't like it, actually. Um, it protects you from the perils of the night and repairs your tissue. How does it protect you from the perils of the night? Because you're, you're not conscious. So. Wouldn't that be more vulnerable? Yes. Uh, well, well, okay, I'll, let me elaborate on that. So, if I'm asleep, I'm actually technically more vulnerable than any because it could walk up on me and bite me or whatever. But what it does by protecting us from the perils of the night is that uh, humans aren't very good at sitting in one place if we're bored. So if we were not tired and wanting to sleep in a safe place, because we, we, we make it as safe as we can, right? We build a house or even if you go further back in time, we get in a cave or make a hut or whatever. Uh, with other humans, so that if there is danger, other humans might alert us or protect us. Uh, so we make the environment safe, first of all. But second of all, if we were bored, um, we would just, we were, we were much more likely to go do something stupid, all right? And at night, humans aren't very good. Uh, while we do have, like, the best vision in the world, except for some birds of prey, as far as, like, how much color and detail we can see, uh, we can't see for anything at night. Right, once the light goes out, unless there's a full moon and then you can kind of see, or you have a torch or something like that, uh, you can't see squat. So you're much more likely to stumble on something that would kill you on accident. All right, so like you might accidentally wander into a den of hyenas, uh, or at least near them at night. They can see you, but you probably can't see them, uh, or lions or whatever, or step on a venomous snake, step on a sharp object that could cut you and give you an infection, fall into a hole, whatever. All right, so that's what I mean by it protects you. Uh, so instead of us being curious, bored humans that would wander out and put ourselves in danger, we instead would just rather, we're, we're tired, we'd rather just sit in one safe place that we've um, um, arranged, and we, we just pass out then. All right, so it does protect us. Protection from night. Perils of night. And it's not that, you know, the things that come out at night are more dangerous. We're just less likely to see them, because that's what we depend on the most. We do depend a lot on hearing, but we're super visual, and uh, if our vision is cut, we are largely useless, all right? So, or I shouldn't say largely useless, but we're a lot more vulnerable to danger. So we're less likely if we're just sleeping in a safe place to just walk into a bad situation. Whereas if there was light, we would avoid it because we could see it. <clears throat> that makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right, because people don't usually get the perils of the night thing, that's why. All right, what else does it do? Oh, I'll, give you, I'll still give you a order box for that answer, though. Right on the topic. Okay. What else we got? No, you looked at your notes. What? What does that mean? My sleep repairs the tissues? What is sleep? <clears throat> Somebody else take a shot at that. Okay, that's, well, we're talking about like dream rolls and stuff like that, um, but let's stick with just the sleep, because she's right, we do repair tissue during sleep. Dreams don't do that, but our body does this while we sleep. Okay, so if I'm active in the day and I'm moving around and I'm using my, uh, my, my brain, my occipital and temporal lobes to like see and hear things and think and move, am I using a lot of or a little bit of energy? Oh. A lot, like as much as I can, for the most part, the only way I can do more is if I'm thinking and like sprinting. That'd be about it. All right, so we're using a lot of energy, a lot of resources. So a lot of the proteins, the carbohydrates, and, and all that that we use, and of course go to the molecular level with like ATP and all that, but we won't go there. Um, you're using those throughout the day. When I'm sleeping at night though, those things are consuming a lot less energy. I'm not moving at all, which we'll get to in a second. 
Um, so I free up a substantial amount of energy and resources that would normally go to me processing all this kind of visual information uh, and moving around and thinking to uh, drastically reducing all of those things. So if I'm not using the energy or resources for moving and thinking, what could I use them for? My body. Repairing tissue. Yeah, repairing any tissue. Or growing, right? Creating new tissue, because that's really what repairing is anyway. My body doesn't like go to a cell and like fix the cell, it just replaces the dead one or the damaged one, right? It comes along and removes the dead or damaged one and just replaces it to grow a new one. <clears throat> so whether I'm growing or repairing, whatever the damage might be, my muscle tissue from using it, uh, just standard deterioration of, of cells, uh, I have the energy and resources to do that when I sleep. So if I don't sleep, I'm not getting those things. So uh, repair tissue. And this is also when I create new immune uh, system cells. So my immune system recovers. If I go without sleep, uh, I am much more likely to get sick and get sick more severely and sick for longer because I am making less of those, um, uh, forget the terminology actually for, for a second, lymphocytes? Isn't that what the uh, immune system cells are called? Whatever, white blood cells, as you guys probably know them. <clears throat> uh, I'm making, there's like different types, which we'll get into later, but that's when your body produces those. So if you don't get sleep, you're producing way less because your body's doing all the moving and thinking. But when I'm sleeping, I'm not moving, my breathing and heart rate are like minimal. My brain's still active, which we'll talk about. But my body can focus on making more of my immune system cells or for antibodies uh, and then repairing. So if I don't get these things when I'm sleeping, uh, I just lack them. So I'll be much less healthy uh, going on. So I'll, I won't recover from injuries or exercise uh, completely or fast enough and my immune system will fall behind, which makes me more prone to getting sick, whether it's cancer or some pathogen or whatever. All right. So sleep important or no? Yes. It is. This is why you don't want to uh, skip sleep. All right. So, speaking of sleep, why do I get tired at night? Like the circadian. Yeah, my circadian rhythm. All right. That's the term for. That's my 24-hour sleep cycle. So, whenever I wake up. By the way, if you want to ever reset your cycle like you want to wake up and go to bed at a different time. It actually doesn't matter when you go to bed. What matters is when you wake up, because that's when your body measures, uh, uh, calibrates itself for the start of your day, all right? And there's something that really helps spark that in your brain. It starts releasing the chemicals that make you feel awake and aroused, as opposed to the ones that start making you feel tired and drowsy for sleep. There's one thing that determines that, the presence of or lack of this thing yeah, sunlight, right, exactly. All right, so it's gonna be largely initiated by sunlight or lack thereof. So when the sun starts coming up, I wake up, my body gets those uh, um, uh, light rays, light waves uh, from the sun. It tells my body, hey, the, do the day is starting, and then it starts um, waking up. And when I say waking up, I don't just mean like, oh, I mean like, releasing the neurochemicals that make me actually feel awake and aroused and alert, all right? The reverse happens at night. When the lights go out, it does the reverse process. It starts to make me feel drowsy, all right? So sleep isn't just random. Sleep's actually a mechanical process in you. Light comes in, your body goes, all right, we're awake, and it makes you feel alert neurochemically, whether it's norepinephrine or whatever. And then when the light goes away, your body's like, oh, okay, um, time to sleep. Right? And this is an evolutionary thing that's helped us survive the night. Because again, our curious ancestors that wander around with bad eyesight died. Uh, and the ones that got tired and slept in a safe spot lived, so here we are. Uh, and what we're left with is our circadian rhythm. Light comes in, brain says it's on time, releases the neurochemicals for that. Light goes away, our brain goes, oh, it's time to sleep, releases the neurochemicals that make me feel drowsy and tired and all of that. All right, does that make sense? All right. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, why do we tend to nap? Uh, that's that's a great question. That's usually for people that are experiencing sleep disorders and might not know it. So you're not getting enough sleep, so your body is trying to kick you into uh, sleep mode so you can repair your immune system, the brain, etc. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk that when I with the sleep apnea, because I have sleep apnea in my family, and usually when they find out they have it, and they're diagnosed, and they get the machine to help them sleep tonight, they don't do naps anymore. 
Whereas before, they had to take naps or their day was ruined. Now they're like, I don't even need naps. I just roll the whole day. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So circadian rhythm, that's my 24-hour cycle. And again, don't forget, if you actually want to reset this, uh, you have to change the time you wake up. It doesn't care that much about when you go to sleep. Obviously, if you go to sleep really late, you won't get a lot of sleep and you'll be miserable. But um, if you want to start waking up at a certain time or sleeping at a certain time, you can uh, change that by just focusing on the waking up time. If you consistently wake up at the same time every day, your body will quickly catch on to that and it'll reset your circadian rhythm to there. So at that point in the day, it'll wake you up relatively, automatically, and then about 16 hours later, it'll automatically make you tired, okay? Um, so why, this was pretty uh, easy for humans throughout most of human history, up until about the 1800s, why would the 1800s start changing circadian rhythms? Be like, hey, I thought I was done with your history class. Isn't it like, I kind of answered, but like the industrial revolution, like you have electricity and light? Electric lighting, yes, exactly right. So candlelight and firelight aren't really enough to stimulate you, like uh, mimic the sunlight. They're not intense enough. So you can actually, uh, that's why you can get tired by like sitting around the fire and all that stuff. Um, but Electric light, depending on the source, uh, can actually mimic sunlight and trick your brain into thinking it's day. So uh, this is why now, anyways, they have settings on phones and computers uh, for um, uh, nighttime or evening mode or whatever, and it cuts off the blue light, which is the most um, energy, because that's the highest frequency, it's the most energy intense. And on your phones, if you don't have that, that option set, you'll keep the blue light on automatically, and it'll make you think it's daylight, so you won't be tired. So there's times you're like, man, I'm not tired. Let me just get on my phone until I get tired. You ain't gonna get tired. Uh, Cause you're telling your body it's daytime. So it's keeping you awake. All right, so that's how, actually phones have made it even worse than just the electrical lighting. Um, so that's, that's a great way. If you're having trouble going to sleep uh, or waking up at a certain time, the best thing you can do is put your phone out of reach. Another room maybe, but I need an alarm clock. But uh, what I do, cause I really struggled with this for a long time. Cause like, you just get bored in bed, man. And you're like, there's my phone. Oh, I've, I, don't, I just wanna look this one thing up. And then, just, you're, and then you're off down the rabbit hole. And then you're on there for three hours. You're like, damn, it's 3 a.m. I gotta get up in two hours or whatever it is. You know? <laughs> so uh, the best thing you can do, and your body's super lazy. Uh, if you put your phone out of reach of your bed, you are way less likely to go get it. Like you could still obviously be like, okay, I'll get out of my blanket and go get this thing and get back in. But you'd be surprised how, infrequently you do that just because it's out of reach. If you put it by your bed, you're just gonna grab it, it's easy. But if you gotta go walk to this side of the room or another room to get it, you're almost certainly not going to, or you will at a much lower rate. So I do that, I put it like, I have my bed and then there's my outlet's a little further down in our master bedroom, so like I can't just reach it. I'd have to like crawl to the edge of the bed and like reach from the edge of the bed to go get it. So I may as well get up at that point. So that actually prevents me from using my phone uh, a lot. My wife struggles with that because she keeps hers by her bed. And like sometimes I'll wake up at night and I just see like this glow. I'm just like, oh, yeah. you ain't sleeping tonight. <clears throat> but it's cool. Uh, right now she's a stay at home mom so she can just sleep in if she needs to for now. Um, when she goes back to work, that's not gonna be fun for her. Um, anyways, circadian rhythm, uh, that's what it is. So do we understand how phones and electric lighting have screwed that up? How have they screwed that up? Someone tell me for Morgan Bucks. Exactly, right. Uh, and if you ever want to start going to bed at a certain time, let's say you're doing the waking up at the right time, um, that'll probably fix it anyway. But when you know you're going to go to bed, for those of you that accidentally stay up too late all the time, um, you intentionally, and this is hard, you pick the time you want to go to bed. Let's just say you want to go to bed at 10 and wake up at six every day or whatever for school. Um, at like 9.30, you should put all of your electronics away. You should be like, you should say goodbye and do your last snap or watch your last TikTok, or whatever the hell it is you're doing. <clears throat> if you can stop doing that. Uh, you should stop that 30 minutes before bed and not use them. Like you can use dim lights and, and, and candlelight and all that crap, but stop using electronics. Then your brain will be like, oh, okay, not day anymore. Time to start kicking in with my melatonin, the thing that makes you tired. Uh, and then um, that'll get you on your way to sleeping at a better a better time. 
All right, so that's what you gotta do. You actually have to, if you know this stuff, you can kind of manipulate your behavior. That's the whole point of psych, by the way. We kind of want to roughly know how we work, so if we want to change something, we can actually change it, all right? I, I bet most of you would be like, well, I just need to go to bed earlier to fix my sleep. It's like, no, you actually need to wake up at a specific time, and then, when you want to go to sleep to get enough, uh, you uh, cut electronics 30 minutes beforehand. Easier said than done, though, um, especially in high school, because you don't have quite the impulse control that adults do. But even adults can't do it, so yeah, it's rough. <clears throat> All right, got that? Okay, so it is kind of a mechanical process, and that's how you uh, go through it. And you need to. Uh, aside from the keeping you safe, which isn't as much a problem anymore because of industrial society and streets and all that, uh, definitely you're lacking the tissue repair and the immune system repair, so you need your sleep. All right, so your body goes through a same sequence of going to sleep, and this is where you might experience sleep disorders, uh, and there are quite a few. So this is the natural cycle, and then again, it's, it's based on sunlight or a lack thereof, and your body kicks in the chemicals uh, when you're going to sleep and when you wake up. So when I'm going to sleep, I go through several stages, and... Um, First one is beta uh, and alpha. Both of these are technically still awake, but this is where things start to get weird, where, I'll just give you my experience, but I know these are common experiences, where you have really random thoughts that don't make sense, but you're still awake, uh, or you uh, start seeing images, like um, for me, for example, if I close my eyes and I'm in one of these stages, I start seeing like this purple and green it's just kind of like, it's like I'm traveling through space and they're just kind of going by me. Maybe you don't have that, I don't know. But this is when you start, um, it's not just that you just close your eyes. If I just close my eyes right now, I mean, nothing's really happening, it's just kind of dark. But when you're in this phase, you might start having random thoughts or more thoughts or seeing images uh, because you looked at a screen too long all day or whatever. Uh, that's when you'll start noticing these things. That's how I always know I'm, I'm about to fall asleep. I'm like, oh, that's weird, okay. I guess I'm almost asleep. And usually I doze off. <clears throat> but these are technically, you're awake. When you're technically asleep is when you start getting into the uh, um, non-REM cycles. And I'll get to the REM here, which is at the end in a second. REM. All right, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, first, there's the three stages of NREM. I actually know a lot about these because um, I've had some, uh, I have a sleep disorder. So I know about these. So NREM, one, two, three. Um, you can dream in these, especially three, but they're not gonna be what you call vivid. You're not gonna remember them very well. Uh, the detail in these dreams is relatively low and you're not very likely to remember them, all right? Um, this is when you do your like really clear, vivid, detailed dreaming um, in the REM stage. So I think, and I might remember these incorrectly, this is supposed to be, for the total time I'm sleeping, this is supposed to be something like, this is 50% of your sleep. This is supposed to be around 30. This is around 10, no, this might be 15 and 25. And then the leftover is uh, the REM. Does that come out to 10? Yes, 10%. I think it's actually a little less than 10%. Uh, that's what my total sleep should be in a given night, if I'm sleeping optimally or normally. Um, they do different things, and again, my dreams are going to be increasingly vivid as I go down. All right, so this is going to be super vivid. Remember, it got a lot of detail. Uh, in stage three here, it's less so. In stage two here, it's less. And, and I don't even know if you can dream in uh, stage one. Um, but I know for sure, the, the further you go into your sleep, the, the more vivid and clear and detailed your dreams are. All right, again, we're not dreams yet, but dreaming is part of sleeping, just like that gentleman over there is experiencing. Hey, there he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what stage did you get to? And REM one? You got all the way to one, you were asleep? I think he's too embarrassed to answer. So, <clears throat> all right. Anyways, I mean, it's, it's what happens when you have to sit on a couch and listen to somebody talk for 45 minutes at a time. All right. Um, these are your stages, and uh, from what I understand, and I, again, I only know this much, not that you know this much for psych, but I'm just going to tell you anyway because it's interesting, because I want to. So, uh, this is where you're doing the bulk of your repair. Uh, and in both of these, well, it's in both. 
In both of these, this is when you're doing a lot of neural stuff, which is part of the dream um, roles or, or, or importance. I can't remember the phrase in the notes, but the reasons why we have them. Uh, this is where the uh, cognitive stuff is taking place. You can say development, yeah. Um, and again, I'll get to those in a minute. But these are super important. If you're missing these, you're really missing out on the benefits of sleeping. Uh, your memory's gonna be worse, your problem solving's gonna be worse, your thinking's gonna be more cloudy, you're gonna be more impulsive, uh, you're gonna not be able to focus for as long, um, you're not going to uh, have the uh, immune or bodily repair that you need to be fully healthy and recovered, uh, and that can actually negatively affect your life, shorten your lifespan, uh, and you can technically, if you're not getting any of this, die eventually just from not having sleep, all right? So this is the normal cycle you get, all right? And your body kind of loops in and out of this, this cycle. It's not like you just go one, two, three, four, and then you sit at REM for the rest of the night. It actually loops back, um, weirdly enough. So this whole cycle from hitting uh, one and going all the way to uh, REM sleep is about 90 minutes. And you have roughly four, maybe depending on how long you sleep, five cycles um, in a night. When you do get into it, I don't think you go back to one. I think you keep cycling back into two, back to three, then REM, and back to two, over and over and over. Um, if you wake up, go to the bathroom, and obviously you start over and all that, but <clears throat> that's kind of what you're doing all night. And the goal is you want to get here, which you only do for about 10 minutes at a time. So in a night, if you sleep perfectly, you're only getting about 40, maybe 45 minutes of um, REM sleep. All right, and that's the one you need at the deep, Technically, it's not deep sleep, but that's the one where you're getting those vivid dreams and all that. Your brain goes crazy uh, in this phase. Uh, as you go down to here, your brain gets more and more active. Like if we hook you up, like I got hooked up to, to an EEG uh, when they did my sleep study. Um, they hook you up and they watch your brain waves and activity and you're the most active uh, down here. It's, it's almost indistinguishable from being awake uh, as far as what your body's doing and um, uh, thinking. <clears throat> okay, so I've been saying REM a lot. What the hell does REM mean? Y'all, okay, rapid eye movement. Um, is he right? okay. Rapid eye movement. Why are my eyes moving? Because they're directly They are, right, there's no uh, mediator. Okay, cool. So, an important part that we understand of sleep here, because these are the stages, and you do need to know them, by the way, uh, for the AP test. But what's important to know here is, what was I saying? What did I just ask? Oh, the eye movement, yeah. What's important to know here is my brain isn't fully shut down, which is why it's a state of consciousness. If it wasn't working at all, I'd just be dead. So this is a different form of consciousness. So, because you are your brain, essentially. If your heart's beating, but your brain's totally dead, then you're just a beating heart that can't do anything, right? So your brain is the one that thinks and moves and does all that stuff. Um, just, it's almost like we're floating meat bags that, that just support and protect our brain. It's almost like you're just your brain and everything that is built around it is designed to either move it, protect it, or feed it. And then that's your brain. And then once your brain goes, you go. <clears throat> Anyways, that was kind of philosophical, but whatever. <laughs> um, sleep. When you're in this sleep state, uh, it's really important that your brain's still active, or at least parts of it. What happens is, when I fall into here, <clears throat> at my brain stem, it's going to uh, cut off my motor neurons, right? At the choke point, the bottleneck, literally my neck, uh, of your uh, central nervous system. So everything neck and below, it stops. I can't remember if it's the medulla or the pons that does it, one of those two. One of the parts in your brain stem stops it. It stops the signals. So I, even if I, my brain and my motor cortex is saying, go right arm, punch that thing in my dream, it's actually doing that in my dream. Like, as I'm dreaming, and I'm here, and there's a monster, or oh, I had a creepy dream the other night about, I was um, at my great grandma's house, which I haven't been to since I was like 10, and I was there washing my hands, the bathroom, and for some reason, there was a door behind me with like this, um, it was like dark, and it went down to this basement, which was pitch black, and I had this weird feeling when I was like washing my hands in the dream, I was like, ugh, and I turned around, and this, this old lady, dead old lady with a lantern, came out of it, and I was just like, oh. And, and I had nowhere to run, so I specifically remember going to punch it, because it looked dead, 
it didn't look like a real person. It looks closer to a zombie. I knew it wasn't a real person or whatever. So like my first instinct was to just try to hit it and away from me. And of course I did like super like nerf slow punch because it's a dream. <laughs> but <clears throat> in that dream where I'm doing that, uh, my brain looks the same as if I'm actually punching somebody. All right, so if you hooked me up to an EEG and I went boom and I punched something, I would have, see a sequence in my motor cortex, right? For my left, well, I'd see both because I'm still doing the other part, but the, the command to do this punch, my right arm is coming from my left hemisphere. I'd actually see that in my brain as I do it. When you're dreaming, I see the exact same thing. So if I was hooked up to an EEG there and they're looking specifically at that moment when I right hand punched or tried to punch this uh, dead ghost lady thing, um, I would see that in my left hemisphere, that signal or activity telling my arm to punch. But does my arm actually punch in, the, uh, in real life? No, why not? Yeah, the signal doesn't get there. It stopped at my, uh, uh, at my brain stem, which is basically the top of my spine. So all motor signals that would go to my central and peripheral nervous system, they can't get there. All right, and that's important because otherwise I would just be moving and kicking and punching in my sleep and I'd never be able to sleep or I'd hit people that are around me or, or whatever. Wait, so when you're sleepwalking, or like, yeah. Yeah, that's like, where, that's where, exactly. There's some sort of error chemically um, that is allowing those signals to actually pass through. Uh, or you haven't actually fallen asleep. You might be experiencing night terror, which is a whole different um, situation. Different brain waves, as far as I know. Uh, and you're not, you're not stopped by um, the uh, uh, brain stem. So yeah, basically, I, I'm not, I don't know the perfect neurochemistry on it, but generally speaking, what you're talking about is some sort of error and the, uh, the motor neurons are actually going through uh, to um, your body, which is why you can talk in your sleep sometimes, um, but uh, you generally don't act them out, all right? So that's the eye thing. That's why in this stage when I'm dreaming, my eyes actually, even though my eyes are closed, you can kind of see because technically the, uh, um, the pupil uh, and the uh, co what's it called? Cochlea? Yeah, no, that's in your ear. Cornea, thank you, thank you. That's <laughs> the cornea actually has a little bulge on the end of your eye. So if you close your eyes and look at somebody and they move their eyes around, you can actually see a little like bulge moving on their eyelid. So if you want to be creepy, uh, and somebody's sleeping next to you, just look at their eyes, um, and they'll, uh, if they're closed, which would be more creepy if they're open, <laughs> if they're closed, uh, you'll actually see them like darting around, you can see little bulge in their eyelids moving around as they, as they look around, because they're actually looking. In their dream, they're looking at whatever it is they think they're looking at, all right? But why, why is my eye doing stuff, but my, my body's not moving? Cut off. What's cut, my eyes are cut off? <laughs> Tell me. You were telling me. Oh, I said that your eyes are directly connected to your brain and there's Yeah, there's no go between on the uh, um, uh, spinal cord, right? And that can happen sometimes with your uh, vocal cords too, uh, in your jaw. That's why you can say things, but you don't move sometimes. But I know the eyes are way more common for whatever reason, because uh, there's no cutoff. So I'm still doing the thing with the eyes, even though um, my body doesn't move. Because again, the cutoff is here. That's not moving. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Why is it important though that only in my somatic nervous system, that only my motor neurons are halted because I can still feel things. And you'll actually feel it in the dream too, by the way. If you ever like somebody, something cold or warm touches you and you're dreaming, you'll feel it in your dream. Or someone touches you, you'll feel it in your dream, that sort of thing. Um, ooh, I have a really creepy one, I can tell you too. <laughs> so is the sensory still there? Yes, obviously, that, yeah, exactly. So uh, motor neurons are cut off because that would wake you up and you'd be hitting other people and it'd be, it'd be a disaster if you were sleeping and just going <laughs> the whole time. So uh, that's cut off, thankfully, by evolution. Just that's, those are the ones that survived that had that. Uh, <clears throat> but also, it does not cut off your sensory neurons. Because, and some of you are like, well, what does that matter? Well. Let's say uh, you're asleep, and this is back from hunter-gatherer day, or even today, uh, and there's a fire, and you're sleeping, and then the fire reaches your blanket or your clothes and your legs and arms and body are on fire, but you can't feel. So you're just sleeping, and you're on fire. Are you going to live? No. no, you're going to die. Even if you don't die from the fire somehow there, you're probably going to die from the infection of the exposed skin that you get, right? Or a, a hyena rolls up, 
and just drags you off. You just you wouldn't feel it, and all of a sudden you'd be half eaten or die in the process because you didn't feel uh, all of those things touching and pulling on you or, or whatever. All right, so your body still remains sensitive to uh, touch because it's important to know what temperature it is, what may or may not be touching you, uh, so that if there is something that's unknown, your body wakes up and responds to it. In response to it. So if I do feel something weird, like um, you know your your spouse or brother or whoever in the future uh, starts pushing you because you're snoring or something, like your body goes, what the hell is that? And you wake up to see what the threat is. Otherwise, you just be like, and you just sit there and nothing would happen. So what about like in surgery when you choose people? That's a different state of consciousness. That's known as technically a coma, uh, or um, uh, is that what they call the anesthetized one? I think so. It's a different state though. Um, that you would add to this. We don't talk about this because it's medical and it's, it's, it's really, you only have it a few times in your life if you have surgery, which most people do eventually. But yeah, that's one where it knocks you out uh, and you hypothetically can't feel anything. They don't actually know if you can feel it when you're out, but when you wake up, you don't remember it. So maybe you're like sitting there going, ah, ah, as they're cutting you open, but you don't remember it. So it's one of those things. So do we know if you're feeling the pain? We don't think so but you could be somehow experiencing it, but when you wake up, you don't remember it, so it is what it is. <clears throat> but yeah, that is a different state of consciousness. Um, how do night terrors affect your, sen the, like, your sensory neurons? Because I know like, some people, they have night terrors, you're not able to wake them up. But... Yeah, that's the weird thing, cause, but they can still respond to you, by the way, um, but it's, it's different. You can't pull them out of the state. <clears throat> so I don't know the uh, neurochemistry behind it. I only know how it presents itself. So I can't give you an answer to that. That'd be a hard one to even look up, I bet. Um, but yeah, when someone's experiencing night terror, you can't wake them up, but I'll, I'll get there in a second. <clears throat> so those are the cycles, all right? And that, that REM sleep is that uh, vivid dreaming. We have a lot of eye movement. Your brain is extremely active. Um, but again, you really need these two, especially that one, uh, to function normally and uh, uh, healthily. Uh, <clears throat> important to know also, again, that your motor neurons are cut off. So you can't move during your sleep, even though your brain is actually telling it to. Uh, but you can feel in case something uh, new pops up, your body can wake up in a response to the threat. All right. <clears throat> but if you don't wake up from it, because let's say it's not like particularly threatening, like your body isn't concerned about it, like it's a mild touch or something like that, you can feel it in your dream. You'll actually feel it or hear it sometimes. I, can, I know there's been several times where there's a TV on or people are talking and I can actually hear it in my dream. Uh, it'll like be part of it, like background noise. And I'll wake up, but here, here's the creepy one. Uh, there was one where um, I was, this was a couple years ago. I had this dream where I was in my house uh, with my wife and um, we were like, we were like sleeping. It was like I was sleeping in, in a dream. So we're doing that and then we uh, heard these noises or something and so I, I, I get up and I'm trying to figure out what it is. And I can tell like in my house, there's like something outside, like almost like apocalyptic. It's like, there's a bunch of things outside and it's like, well, I guess, I guess we're gone. Um, so I was thinking about what to do and uh, I, I can see, and it's actually some sort of gombi, gombi, zombie uh, ghost thing uh, coming. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was clearly something that was uh, very, very, Creepy, like what you would see in a, in, a, in, a, in a terror movie or a horror movie. Um, by the way, I don't actually have dreams like this very often, so I remember them so well. I'm making it sound like these were all my dreams, but <clears throat> I have like one or two bad dreams that I remember like per quarter. So I maybe have 10 in a year that I remember. But anyways, but I remember them really well because I hardly ever have them. So anyways, uh, this it's like a ghost thing. They're trying to get in the house and I can see one of them. And I'm ready to, because I can't run, I know I'm surrounded, it's like, well, I just gotta fight this thing, I guess, because what else am I gonna do? And um, I'm like telling my wife to do something, and then I feel something on my finger, uh, and I look over, and this is the creepiest thing. My wife has turned into one of those zombie things, and she's gnawing on my finger in the dream. I'm like, ah! Oh! And I woke up, no, I woke up, and it was actually, um, uh, my wife was, was tugging on my hand for something. But in my dream, it came across as something was eating, like this zombie thing was eating my hand for like a brief moment. But I remember being like, oh, like it was, it was crazy. Uh, but then it was actually my wife tugging on my hand for some reason. She was trying to get me up or I don't know what it was, but 
I was like, whoa. And then I, I re quickly realized, I was like, oh, I felt that in my dream. You actually affected my dream by pulling my hand. And I like, felt it and you pulled me out of it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so you can feel things in your dream. And again, if your body's, um, if it appears threatening, your body will wake you up. Like if it's too hot or too cold or too violent or, or whatever. Uh, and that's important. Otherwise, you would just die if something bad happened when you were sleeping. There's a fire or, or a flood or something like that. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the stages of sleep. Uh, sleep disorders, and there's four I think we talked about in here, basically disrupt this cycle somehow. Either it's uh, disabling or interfering with your uh, circadian rhythm, uh, or it's interfering with your natural sleep cycle. Okay? So there's uh, insomnia. There's sleep apnea, there's narcolepsy, and there is the night terror thing. That one's not as, that one's just kind of weird, but not threatening per se. Um, my stepson gets these, by the way, so like once a month we wake up to this fun event. Um, so, a night terror, more common in boys for some reason, uh, and it happens usually between the ages of three and 12, and then kind of goes away in adolescence. I don't know if that's like a testosterone thing or a puberty thing, but whatever it is. Um, this is where, for an unknown amount of time, they will wake up uh, and they are, uh, they call it terror because they're often in a state of terror. Like they're sweating, their heart rate's going crazy, and they feel like uh, something very bad is happening. Usually in their dream, it's kind of like a nightmare. And this is different from a nightmare, by the way. Nightmare is just, you had a bad dream, it was scary. This is, your body is in panic mode and you're actually seemingly awake. So they will sit up and scream or say things or do things, but they're out. Like they're in a different state of consciousness in which they're locked into some sort of dream. They've somehow gained motor skills. Uh, they're usually, of course, in a situation in which they are experiencing some sort of terror from the dream. Uh, and uh, you can't wake them up. Even if you talk to them and shake them and all that, they're still stuck in this, wow, this state of just being in terror, uh, and then they'll randomly uh, go out of it. And the craziest thing is, they have no memory of it whatsoever. You'll wake up the next day, we'll be like, do you remember for 20 minutes screaming your head off, calling for mommy and saying you were gonna die? It's like, nope, he has no idea. He has no idea it ever happened. Um, so uh, night terrors, I don't know the neurochemistry behind it, but it's a weird phenomenon where you're acting out some sort of uh, very scary situation, and it seems like you're awake. You can talk and interact. You're not just talking, by the way, and, and it doesn't matter what we say to you. You can respond to what we're saying. Like, you hear us and respond back to us, but you're in this other state, and you have no memory of it later. Uh, my brother didn't get night terrors, as far as I know, but he, slept, he would have sleepwalking, and it was similar. Uh, you could wake him up, kind of, but it was actually kind of fun, because you could uh, talk to him. <laughs> Uh, and he'd respond back to you. Uh, and he'd like, he always mumble too. So it'd be like, I remember one time, uh, we, it's, it's kind of hard to move out uh, when you're a young adult because you don't make much money. So my brother and I moved out together and shared an apartment, which was super fun by the way. I'd, I'd suggest that. But anyways, we did that and um, I knew he, he, he sleepwalks because I've lived my whole life with him. So I know that, I've seen it before. Usually he's bumbling around doing something stupid and then you're like, yo, his name's Dustin. Like, hey Dustin. You're sleepwalking, go to sleep. And he'll be like, ah, he'll, just, <laughs> he'll go back to sleep. And so I just, it's like 2 a.m. and I wake up, or maybe I, was, maybe I was gaming. I don't remember what it was. I woke up where I was gaming and I could hear a bunch of commotion in my brother's room. And he, he goes to bed, at least at the time he went to bed at like 10, because he would get up for work around six. Uh, so I was like, he's not awake, he's, he's sleepwalking. And I go in there and he's got like all of his clothes on the ground. He pulled, he pulled them out of his closet. And he's like moving his desk, and I'm like, and he's, it's, it's pitch black, so he's he's sleepwalking. It's like, Dustin, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just had a blah, blah, blah. He's like explaining it, but he's just totally asleep. He's it's part of his dream, and I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, just go to bed, dude. You're sleepwalking, and then he does the usual thing. He's like, oh, but I can remember. I'm like, no, no, you gotta go to bed. You're sleepwalking. <laughs> and he goes back to sleep, and then uh, and then I asked him the next day, and, he, and I was like, hey, did you notice there's a bunch of clothes on your floor in the morning or, or whatever? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, you know, you did that, right? And that was you in your sleep that did that. And he's like, oh, did I sleepwalk? He's like, yeah. Do you remember? He's like, nope, doesn't remember anything at all. Uh, but <clears throat> I should have recorded it. But <laughs> anyway, that was like 10 years ago. So, anyways, uh, that's what uh, um, night terrors are, and sleepwalking is different, uh, but it's it's. Uh, Somehow you're acting your dream out and you're 
motor neurons are getting the signals from your uh, motor cortex. Okay, that's Night Terrors, and mostly boys 3 to uh, 12, and if you're in that situation, try not to. My wife's super bad with this. There's a kid crying. She just gets anxiety. She can't help it. It's her emotional response to it. Uh, we'll get to that when we talk about emotions in, um, and anxiety in, in uh, Unit 7. But anyways, um, it's pretty hard, though, because you have this kid you care about who's just screaming in terror. There's literally nothing you can do. You can't really calm them. All you can do is make sure they don't, like, accidentally hurt themselves, like walking into a wall or, or, or whatever. But you kind of just have to let them run out of steam. So they'll be screaming and terrified, and you can't help them out. But you just, all you can really do is make sure they don't, like, um, stumble onto something that might accidentally hurt them. So, yeah, it's a crappy situation, but it happens. Um, narcolepsy. This is... Again, there's different types, and I don't know the chemical reasons for it, but narcolepsy is where you're not getting enough sleep in your normal cycle, so your body is trying to uh, get you into a sleep state, which can sometimes cause people to just fall asleep um, even though they're not trying to, like in the day. Like extreme narcolepsy is like if I'm driving my car uh, and I'm, I'm not getting enough sleep or whatever, I could just all of a sudden be like, and fall asleep at the wheel, which is obviously incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're at work uh, operating anything that's, that could affect someone's life or body, uh, it can be dangerous. Um, and uh, there's lots of different types of it, and, but I'm just gonna talk about the blanket term. This is one where, for some reason, you're not getting a, a normal sleep cycle, um, and your body is making you fall asleep when you're not willing to. It could just be that it makes you groggy, so you take lots of naps. You could still technically have narcolepsy and, and, and fit those uh, criteria. Or you could have this really rare extreme version where you just, you're walking around all of a sudden you go and you just fall asleep um, out of nowhere. Uh, there's YouTube videos of uh, people that happens to, but I always, I'm always like, yeah, but does that person just fake need for the video? Um, but there's animals that have it too, and animals can't fake that. Um, so they'll have like dogs, narcoleptic dogs, and they're just running around playing, all of a sudden they'll just go, and they just go limp. And they'll be like, and then they'll get up and they'll start playing again, and then they'll just, they'll just go limp. So uh, it's a real thing. Uh, but the one I'm describing where you're just falling asleep out of nowhere, super, super, super rare. You'd obviously know if you had that by now. Um, but uh, most narcolepsy, because they're this is the one that they're seeing if I have this or not. I do a 48 hour sleep test where I, they monitor me for 48 hours uh, and they're gonna try to get me to take naps. And basically, they're gonna look at my brain waves and the rate at which I can or can't nap and how I can sleep uh, and assess if I have narcolepsy or not. Um, so we'll see what I have. But whatever I have, my mom totally still has, she has, because she has similar sleeping issues, and my grandma. So me figuring out will probably cure it for them too, because they'll figure out what they have, what medication they need to make it better. Um, for now, I use antihistamines, which are, um, like uh, an allergy medication that make you feel drowsy, and they're not addictive, um, so I use those, and that really helps me out. Um, but yeah, I'll figure out what it is eventually when I do it. Because when I did this sleep test, and they just did one night of watching me sleep with EEG and all that, um, in one night, they tested me for um, six hours, and I was, um, I was trying to sleep the whole time. I was awake for two hours, so that sucked. Just laying there. <laughs> and it was weird to you could see on the graph where I'd be, I'd be dancing in and out of these. Like I almost fell asleep and something kept me awake. I almost fell asleep and something kept me awake. So two hours I was just awake. And I remember the times that I were, I was too. It took me over an hour to fall asleep and I woke up in the middle of the night wide awake for no reason. And I just like had to sit there for like an hour. And I got four hours of total sleep technically. But um, in that time I was briefly in NREM1 and all of it was NREM2. I, w I received zero NREM3, and I received like 10 minutes total of REM. So I'm getting like nothing, <clears throat> uh, according to my sleep study. So I'll find out this year uh, what I have or don't have, and hopefully I can fix this. But um, ever since I started using the antihistamines, whew, my life is way better. Like, and we'll talk about why in a minute when we get to dreams. <clears throat> so uh, that would be insomnia, what I'm describing. All right, so I might, I might have a narcolepsy issue where I can't regulate my sleep cycle, so that makes me tired and groggy uh, throughout the day. Um, or I could have insomnia, which is where either your brain, for whatever reason, has a hard time initiating sleep or maintaining it. So it means I could have a hard time getting to sleep, 
like I sit there awake forever, my thoughts race, or I'm not tired, or whatever, uh, or I'm constantly waking up um, in the night and then not getting that full sleep cycle. So I don't know what I have yet. Uh, it could be either, I guess. Last one that we talk about in this class is sleep apnea. This one runs in my family, but I don't have it because they would have noticed during this test if I had it or not. This is different. This is less dependent on my um, neurochemicals. By the way, we'll take a break after I'm done talking about uh, sleep apnea. It's not neurochemically related. It's actually related to your breathing. So sleep apnea means uh, because of your air passage, whether it's um, through your nose or whatever, is um, becoming obstructed when you sleep. So you're stopping breathing. You're getting like no oxygen for however many times. Uh, your body obviously goes, ah, ah, we're not breathing. So they wake you up so you can move or, or whatever. And usually uh, you don't know you're doing that. Like you'll wake up, but you'll still be in um, either a low stage of sleep or one of these stages where you're not actually fully awake. So you don't even notice it. So like my grandpa, for example, they did a sleep test on him, and in one hour, he woke up 80 times. So that was more than once a minute. And he never knew he was waking up because he'd just be like spiking in and out of here. Because uh, he would, uh, his oxygen would get cut off, and his body would wake him up to move, so he'd keep breathing. And he never even got anywhere near these stages here. Uh, he and my uncle both had it, and um, they were always super tired all day. They would have to take naps in the day. But as soon as they took these sleep tests and found out that it was because they had sleep apnea, which again is where you're stopping breathing, um, and your body wakes you up, sometimes fully, sometimes just a little bit, and you don't know about it, um, because the oxygen supply was cut off, that would, would cause you from getting the sleep you need to get. So the cure for this one is like this mask thing um, that they basically give you, and it, it just pushes oxygen in, and so you never wake up. Never wake up. So you never wake up uh, when you're not supposed to, and you get the full uh, sleep cycle, and then you can wake up, um, you know, when your alarm clock goes off or whatever, and you're actually rested. And it really helped um, the quality of life for my grandpa and uncle because they don't feel tired during the day. They just feel awake and alert the whole day. They don't have to take naps, and they just go to bed, and then they can actually uh, dream and remember it. So, if you're someone who is constantly tired all day or has to take naps and all that, you might have narcolepsy or sleep apnea or insomnia. Uh, and they'd only be able to find that out if uh, you went and did a sleep test, which you'd have to like go to a doctor for and get a recommendation for, a referral for, and then go to the sleep center and do it. But man, me just learning that I have something, um, not sleep apnea, that was ruled out, uh, and then doing the antihistamine thing, that's been way helpful for me. So if you're ever experiencing that, look into it. <clears throat> Obviously, some people might be allergic to antihistamines, even though they're anti-allergy meds and, and all of that. And you have to consider the other medications that you're um, taking. So obviously, ask your doctor about that and all that. Mm -hmm. So you can't sue me. I told you to ask your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that, that's what I do, and it really helped me out. And I did actually, by the way, consult my doctor on that one, too. Because uh, again, sometimes you'd be like, oh, I just take this pill? But you don't know that if it interacts with this other pill you're taking, it could kill you or whatever. So that's why you always have to, to check. But yeah, so I'll find out what I have soon enough, but that's basically uh, sleep and the stages and the disorders. Do we understand that? Mm -hmm. Sweet. We'll talk about dreams uh, after the break. Take a break for now.